I am Anna Kaisa Kultima, and this is Games Now. Games Now is an open lecture series on the hot topics of game industry. Today's topic is one of the most important issues in the contemporary game development, especially in mobile games. Um, the dominant model for games is nowadays service model. The game, most of the games are not boxed products anymore, and when they are launched, the, the work is not over. So in order to make your, or keep your players playing your game, you need to make sure that you do the best possible job in live operations. Today's panelists are on the top of the game industry. Supercell, Rovio and Next Games are here to share their insights and lessons learned in live operations. Welcome to Design Factory, Alta University. Welcome to Games Now. So, we have invited Heini Kaihu, Emmi Kuusikko and Lauri Algren uh, from our top uh, companies to explain their processes and lessons in uh, live operations. Unfortunately, Reko Ukko wasn't able to uh, join us today. We have a flu season, so we have one casualty. <laughs> so, before we go to the mini presentations that our panelists today have prepared for us, let's do a couple of questions. And the classic in panels is, of course, introduction. So please introduce yourself to us and please also perhaps, perhaps enlighten us a little bit. How did you end up in game industry and especially this job that you're doing now? So, Heini. Okay. Hi, my name is Heini and um, I, I work at Rovio. I run one of the Rovio's uh, game studios and uh, we make puzzle games. And uh, Actually, interesting question, how did I end up in the, in the game industry? Uh, very long story short, I, um, I, I worked with mobile um, since 2000, and uh, from that, uh, somehow my path actually uh, uh, direct me, directed me to uh, Sulake, uh, who was uh, developing uh, a product which is kind of game, kind of open world, uh, uh, virtual world, one may say, called uh, Hubba Hotel. And uh, that was uh, developed for the uh, teenagers, and uh, that's how I started. And uh, worked there for eight years, and uh, then um, changed uh, to Rovio uh, in the phase where the uh, free-to-play transformation in, in mobile was uh, about to begin. And uh, that's how I ended up there and uh, love my job. Uh, excited about the free-to-play and mobile games and very excited about live ops. Yeah, a lot of experience already. <laughs> so, Emmy, how did you en end up here? And uh, a little bit introductions. Yes, so hi everyone. My name is Emmy Kuusikko and I'm the head of live services and live games at uh, Next Games. And uh, I actually also started my gaming career in Sulake. Uh, <laughs> uh, that was a bit more than 13 years ago. I was heading the user and market insights uh, team there. And then after that, uh, I've been working in a number of gaming companies, uh, Digital Chocolates, uh, Lionhead with Microsoft Studios, and then Reforge Studios, and, and now with Next Games. And uh, basically, almost in every company, working with all things live, so uh, product management, uh, analytics and uh, the whole kind of community uh, engagement and, and, and uh, monetization bits. And uh, yes, so now with these same, same topics with uh, Next Games. Thank you for joining us today. How about you, Lauri? Yeah, so uh, my name is Lauri Algren. Next Games. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so my story is a little bit different. Um, uh, economics uh, drop out, <laughs> uh, actually going to film industry, uh, then having a few of my own companies based on more like storytelling, and then ended, ended up on games industry working at Supercell. And uh, um, also sort of not originally from, from game, game design perspective, uh, joined a Clash Royale team at Supercell last, uh, like about a year ago. 
and uh, um, yeah, and then been basically learning by doing, uh, like actually quite many people at our company, um, and uh, now running uh, live ops for Clash Royale. Yeah, that's 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 about it. All right, so live operations is not the familiar term for everybody here today. So maybe you could enlighten us what we actually mean when we talk about live operation. What is live operations and what is not live operations? Who would like to start? Maybe I'll start. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, uh, we've been discussing this a lot also internally and uh, I think that there are like there's tons of great presentations on uh, on, on different companies, different service pro providers actually are uh, explaining what live ops is and uh, what are the tools that should be used. Uh, we we often hear also term uh, lean live ops. I, I think Space Ape is is one uh, that has introduced that. Um, we see it maybe a bit differently. I, I think that for us, uh, live ops is everything that we do to live games to actually make them. Uh, perform better and, and most importantly make them more fun for the players. So they kind of like the, the player engagement uh, increase, uh, whether it's with kind of like different uh, tools or actually uh, developing the game further uh, is live ops for us. So everything that happens after the launch. Yes. Okay. Any kind of uh, different views on that? Well, yeah. pretty similar. So in kind of very shortly, I would say that it's just about all the changes that you keep making to a game uh, when it's in a, in a live environment. Um, and uh, kind of very integrated to that is like how you look at the data and how you get the player feedback so that you understand like what works uh, and, and what not. And so that the basically experience is, stays fresh and alive and interesting and, and engaging and exciting to the players. Yeah, and uh, from Clash Royale perspective, live ops is um, still mostly uh, something that happens between the big updates. Uh, so the game is still trying to work on what is the next big thing for the game, and uh, uh, li live operating the game is basically what happens between the updates, um, uh, creating events, making the game eventful, uh, and also sort of pro providing better service to the players. Uh, trying to provide better value for the players also. That's how I would describe live ops for Clash Royale. Thank you. In order to understand a little bit more concretely, we have your mini presentations and uh, maybe Haini, you could start with your presentation to look at the more concretely what uh, Rovio is doing with, with your products and live operations. Thank you. <coughs> All right, um, so as I already uh, mentioned, uh, I've been doing um, mobile services uh, and, and even mobile games uh, already since uh, 2000, um, which now seems quite a long time ago. Um, um, worked eight years uh, in Sulake uh, with Habbo Hotel, um, amazing product um, and uh, amazing company. Um, and, and now with Rovio a bit over five years. Um, and uh, we often, when we talk about the live ops, uh, it, it also is very connected uh, to free to play. And um, I could say that uh, my experience with free to play is roughly about 13 years. And uh, at, at Rovio, uh, we've been uh, doing in, in my studio uh, five games uh, so far um, and um, uh, four of them are actually uh, kind of like uh, modern uh, puzzle games um, that uh, you could also think of it uh, from the live ops perspective. Uh, a bit about Rovio as, as always. Uh, um, although I, I think that a lot of you already know, we are a games first entertainment company. Uh, we have two business units, uh, brand licensing and, and games. And uh, within games, uh, we have uh, five different studios uh, in three locations in Espo, Stockholm and London. And um, as said, I'm running the puzzle studio. We are here uh, at Espo and uh, 
a bit over 50 people there are doing um, both uh, internal and external development. Um, when we look at the Rovio Games portfolio, we have uh, 19 uh, titles altogether. And, and um, when we look at the best uh, performers uh, last year, uh, f from four, two were actually uh, puzzle games. And that's uh, actually what I'm briefly talking today to you about. Um, what is live ops in puzzle games? I think that uh, that may not be the kind of like the, the most obvious uh, uh, combination, but uh, we are eagerly finding out what it means and uh, what we think that it should actually be also in the future. And uh, just as uh, Red has developed uh, over the years, also uh, the um, Live ops in, in puzzle games uh, has uh, evolved, and also how we actually make the games to be uh, operated uh, when they are live. Um, and um, if I go back to early days, um, some of the uh, things that uh, were with the games uh, back then, linear level content uh, usually arranged in saga map format, uh, familiar uh, from King. And uh, usually you could also see your Facebook friends uh, in, the, uh, in the saga map. Uh, games had regular content updates uh, with new levels and new level mechanics. Uh, first, uh, probably like every two or even three months, but then uh, when the data really kicked in and then we started to see how fast the uh, hardcore fans actually uh, browsed through the content, also, the uh, levels were added at increasing pace. Um, player goals for the puzzle games early days, uh, they were fairly simple. Uh, it was about getting to the next level. It was about passing your friend um, at map. Uh, it was about getting three stars uh, from one level. And uh, for the hardcore fans, it was about um, completing the game uh, for that uh, certain moment, which was reaching the end of the content. So uh, from the, uh, already from the early days, uh, we saw that we actually do have a lot of uh, players who are waiting for the next levels uh, at the end of the uh, content. Um, it, uh, when, when we kind of like uh, look at it now, uh, it seems that many things uh, could have been done differently, but there were also pros for that approach. And they were that uh, it was fairly simple. Uh, for the players, uh, it was really easy to grasp the goals uh, I'm supposed to uh, uh, progress in the saga map. I'm, I'm supposed to get the th three stars from this level and so forth. Uh, from the kind of like business and design side, uh, it was fairly predictable and uh, it was um, not necessarily easy to control, but at least easier to control uh, than the games nowadays. But there were also things that uh, were not working that well. Uh, one of the things uh, was that the importance of one single level was enormous. Uh, one single level uh, could actually um, turn your players from the game altogether. Uh, if you manage to do a great level, uh, also the, the revenues for, um, for that level uh, could also be um, enormous. So it's kind of like the both sides of the, sides of the coin. But as I said, uh, the importance of one single level's balance was huge. And um, when, when it all started, uh, I remember that uh, it was really great to actually um, do the App Store descriptions and, and say that over 300 levels of, of great uh, gameplay. And uh, that worked still as a kind of like promise of a, a kind of like that. This is a, a game that you probably want to download and play. It has the promise of the content um, and so forth. But when, when you kind of like uh, started adding the levels at increasing pace and, and started hitting um, the level co count of over 1,000, then for a new player, that may not be kind of like a promise of a uh, great gameplay experience uh, 
to wait for him or her, but actually really overwhelming. And um, as already mentioned, the level content treadmill uh, together the hardcore fans that were always at the end of the content, um, it, it definitely was painful. Um, and uh, well, that's, that's kind of like, I'm, I'm not saying that we are kind of like totally out of that yet, but uh, it was kind of like the only way to actually uh, monetize the, uh, the, those hardcore fans. And, and for that reason, uh, uh, we just kind of like didn't have an option not to uh, keep on turning those levels uh, for them. Then uh, where are we today? Um, we have hybrid games that combine both the linear game progression uh, with a meta layer. And examples of, of those kind of games uh, could be, for example, Gardenscapes. Their meta layer is a builder. Um, in, in our game, um, in Angry Birds Match, our meta uh, layer is a collection game. But um, something that uh, is kind of like enhancing the Tussi uh, saga map progression or linear game progression. Then our uh, events, um, and I think that we will be uh, talking about those a bit more uh, still today. They are in increasing role, um, and, and there are two types of events, uh, both kind of like regular uh, daily and weekly events um, that play with the kind of like already existing content in the game. And then, uh, of course, uh, kind of like the bigger seasonal or even branded events uh, that we do, uh, for example, Christmas or Halloween or uh, seasons like that. Uh, then, as Emmy already mentioned, uh, the data that uh, we get from the games, it's like it is there uh, all the time, and, and we look at the data all the time and uh, monitor the games and also operate the games on the fly all the time. Um, for example, if we see that uh, we, we are running an event and uh, we see that, uh, okay, not all the people are progressing uh, through the event at the pace that we think that they should, then we can go and uh, somehow help them in the game, uh, either um, giving them a bit more boosts or, or letting them uh, to get free lives uh, so that they actually have uh, more time to actually uh, try out the levels. Um, and then what are the pros for that uh, current approach that we are now working with? It definitely gives more variety for the players. It gives them meaningful short and midterm goals. Um, and then one thing that uh, I think that is a big thing, uh, new game elements and, and seasonal content uh, is uh, available for all, not only for the kind of like end of content players, but uh, everybody who is basically past the uh, tutorial, uh, they get to enjoy uh, the seasonal content and, and the great new game elements. Um, and, and one thing uh, probably to keep in mind with this approach is that uh, once your game gets more complex, uh, also the onboarding and uh, player experience uh, is more demanding and uh, more testing and, and monitoring is needed. Um, I'll give you a brief example of what the event that I mentioned uh, could be like. And uh, for those uh, who don't uh, know the Angry Birds match game, it's, it's basically a match three game where you collect uh, hatchlings and outfits for them. And uh, you have different uh, worlds and, and kind of like themed worlds uh, where the uh, hatchling collection is kind of like tied to. And then uh, you play special events. And um, the event that I use as an example uh, is the holiday or Christmas event uh, that we have just analyzed. And, uh, what it was, was actually a themed holiday area uh, with hatchlings, those cute furry uh, baby birds, and uh, outfits uh, for them that players could collect. It lasted almost a month, so we started it pretty early and uh, took uh, advantage of the whole uh, holiday season and um, ended it in the beginning of January. Players had uh, over 
270 levels uh, in 15 uh, events, and, and we had three different events, event types, and they were uh, sequentially ordered. Um, and uh, we had both midterm uh, goals and rewards, but also a, a big reward at the end. And uh, what this event or campaign uh, did for the, for the uh, game, uh, first of all, over 60% of the active players uh, participated uh, in the campaign uh, during the time. And uh, for us, uh, we've, been, we've been working a lot um, trying to uh, get the participation rates uh, up as, as much as possible. And I, I think that that has been our, uh, for the puzzle games, that has been the uh, highest uh, to the moment. Uh, we also see increased engagement during the whole campaign, not just the holiday time where you would naturally expect the uh, players to have a bit more time also at their hands, but we saw it uh, throughout the whole uh, four weeks. And then uh, what is uh, important for the business, uh, of course, is the uh, increase in monetization, and, and that uh, increased over 50% uh, during the event. So um, participation rate uh, shows that it was fun for the players, as, as does the uh, increase in engagement, and then uh, also the uh, good for the business uh, increase in, in monetization. And I left out, but uh, something that uh, was definitely there as well was how the uh, player, uh, com our, our player community actually uh, uh, also were active in the Facebook pages, in, in uh, Instagram and, and Twitter, uh, where we are. Uh, Kind of like then, then have the kind of like informal uh, discussion uh, with them. So a, a really successful uh, campaign uh, in that sense. Having said that, um, we we have of course we we um, think that that okay, uh, what is working well and and what uh, could we still do better, and and this is our thinking of our. Uh, if we were to start the development of the game now, today, uh, how we would we do it uh, from this perspective? And that would uh, actually include starting the game design from the live ops uh, and events perspective, and uh, designing the player experience and the meta layer expansion uh, expansions for two to three years uh, from uh, the launch date onwards. So we've been talking a lot uh, the kind of like the the term for the player stickiness, the retention rate, uh, and are measuring it at different uh, um, time spans. Uh, usually talking about day one retention, day thirty retention, uh, even day uh, one hundred and eighty, uh, and so forth. But I think that here, uh, when we when we look at the uh, operating the the game uh, in, in live ops, it should be uh, the design for the uh, retention for a uh, day 1000. Then uh, make sure your game has exclusive content uh, to collect, collect and compete for. Uh, when, when I say exclusive, uh, it, it just needs to be something that is emotionally, uh, that you can create the kind of like the emotional attachment for the players to be so strong that they actually want to collect that. Um, and uh, that they can actually somehow see it and, and keep it in the game. Um, and because uh, that, that is usually where the uh, event and campaign loops then are, um, are, are built around. If you are still working uh, in, in puzzle games with levels, uh, make sure that your level content is easy to pr produce and uh, more importantly, reuse. If you create great levels, then make sure that you can actually later uh, reuse them in the campaigns and events uh, so that they are not just once passed and, and then forgotten. Um, and then uh, think how game rules can be configured to create new ways to play the game. Uh, if there are some that if you, if you uh, change this config, does this actually uh, make the game a bit more fun for the players, for example, just for the weekend? 
And then uh, I, I think that uh, when we started, there were the kind of like Facebook friend uh, connection uh, in the puzzle games. Um, and that was it. You could see your friends, you could send them lives and, and, and do very kind of like minimal social interaction. But I think that also for the puzzle games, uh, uh, it's time to actually have their uh, proper social layers, uh, guilds, leaderboards, the things that we are kind of like used to in other types of the games, but are also very important uh, uh, in, in the puzzle games. Uh, they, they can definitely uh, boost the engagement. And when you design those, make sure that they actually connect meaningfully uh, to your core groups. But this is um, what we at Rovio have been uh, thinking about the, the live ops when it comes to puzzle games. And um, um, I'm, I'm eager to then, uh, at the end of the session, uh, hear your experiences and, and, and learnings and questions, uh, if you have any. Thank you. A lot of tips for us, for the future, for, for the game develop, development also in the audience. Um, but let's talk about a little bit of how is it actually done. So what is the team that does the live operation? Does it, uh, is it different from the dev team? Is the dev team doing the live operation? So how does it work? How does it work at Rovia? How do you do it? Well, uh, we like to think that uh, whoever is the team that uh, has the idea for the game and they develops the game and does the, you know, the soft launching of the game and, and then also globally launching is the team that also then operates the game when it's live. Um, having said that, there obviously there, there can be some kind of like uh, a bit of kind of like uh, some different roles or competencies needed uh, when the game is actually live. Um, some, some competence groups are, are becoming more and more important and, and then are some are not needed maybe in, in that great numbers. But usually um, I, I think that that's kind of like that. It's, it's a team who develops the game that also operates in live kind of like guarantees for us that they need to think about the live operations when they are developing the game. Right. How is it for, for you, uh, Heini and uh, uh, Emmy, sorry, Emmy and Laura, how is it also for you? Is it the same that the, the same team continues with the live operations uh, or do you separate it? Yes, we have a bit in a, a similar way like the game team who like develops and then operates the game. But uh, what's really important is that there's like these dedicated resources uh, in, inside the game team. Um, and it also depends a bit of, of the kind of phase of the game, like that if there's still a lot of feature development and actual features coming out during the live phase, which, which is often uh, the case, then you need to have uh, people who are dedicated to kind of actually make it the features. And then at the same time, like if you are still building up uh, the kind of live operations functions, because it takes time to kind of learn how everything works and like make sure that the tools are according to like what you need and so on, so that there needs to be like also like coding resources for the live side that are dedicated um, for that. Um, but then if, if you think uh, outside of that, that the kind of core live team that there, of course, is people like who actually operate uh, the events and push things live. There's community people, player support people. Um, there needs to be dedicated QA resources to make sure that everything goes uh, well. Um, for app management resources to kind of figure out what are we actually doing here, what are the targets, how does it uh, fit with the kind of goals of the game, um, and then the content, the kind of art uh, resources, so that it's all kind of allocated that there's enough uh, people doing, doing the, these things. But having said that, like some of these uh, roles can be spread uh, across teams so that you don't need to hire, like if you have several game tracks, you don't need to hire all these uh, people in every team. Like for example, uh, producing um, marketing or, or community art is, is something that uh, can, can be uh, done across teams. So hmm. hope how that uh, helped a bit. Yeah, how about Supercell? <laughs> so, uh, actually, in my presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about small teams, but it's like um, last spring, I was the only person doing live ops, and uh, 
in August we doubled our live ops department, so there's two people doing live ops. <laughs> um, uh, that's not the complete truth in a way, because it's like uh, in, in, for example, in our team, it, yeah, it depends on on the game team. They can decide, but like in our team, we have now, uh, I think we have 18 members in the team, so everyone's part of it somehow, at least from feedback perspective. And also, like, uh, you know, I can't, uh, I'm not a client coder. In some cases, we need a client coder to do something, or someone, uh, uh, you know, thinks about the new game mode and then just does it, and then we can use it uh, through our live ops tools. So, of course, there's more people, but uh, sort of responsibility is uh, only for two guys. Uh, which for us feels like the right kind of approach, but then if I think about like Chinese games, uh, you need thousand people to do live ops. Uh, not all all of the Chinese games, but like uh, um, like like if it's really content heavy, there needs to be lots of people. Um, same thing, for example, Japan. Think about Monster Strike. If you have played, uh, lots of new content coming in all the time. It needs huge uh, sort of like machinery uh, to actually get the content done. But our approach is the other end. So you only need two people <laughs> to run live ops, in our opinion. But then you also have community and player yeah, support yeah, that you... Yeah, can there's like kind a, of there's a community, uh, there's player support. Uh, we have a, an internal team working on uh, uh, tools. So uh, we have marketing in, you know, <laughs> many different countries uh, helping us. So mm. definitely there's lots of, lots of people um, as part of it. Tahini was talking about uh, core competencies in, in the team. So what, what are these skills that are needed for successful live operations? We can guess a little bit about metrics, but what, what do you think are most important? Maybe Laura, you can talk about yourself. What is the, what would you like to be even better at? <laughs> So what are the skills? Um, so I guess actually storytelling is one good skill in a way because you have to think about how like uh, how things feel for the player and um, and uh, at least uh, in our case like we want to we want to we want to do more and more sort of like integrated live ops in a way that it, it, it might happen uh, outside of the game at the same time. I think you guys are working really well with the TV show kind of. Um, yeah, we so have a no, bit of yeah, a yeah, experience, different but, approach. I yeah, will go yeah, a bit yeah. more into detail. But it's like uh, um, the core competence yeah. is uh, sort of you have you have to be able to, uh, in our case, like design, like uh, have some design skills, and of course, lots of communication skills because you need people's uh, opinions, and then um, uh, just uh, you have to be brave because when you push things live, quite many people will see it. Uh, then um, the, uh, the, the third one is like, uh, uh, I would say you have to be able to, uh, after you've been brave and put things live, you have to be able to learn through, through data and uh, uh, most importantly, community feedback. How about Haney? What, what were the competences that you, point, you were pointing at? I think that competencies like uh, obviously the uh, the analytics mm. and uh, ability to actually uh, look at the game and understand what's happening uh, for a you know a group of players a single player and and that sort of stuff I think that that's that's kind of like almost like the number one um, then um, as already mentioned communication skills uh, how to kind of like how to like even even if you make some you know small tweaks or something how do you actually kind of like package it so that it's it's fun for the players that they actually like get the kick out of it and um, and, uh, and and get some buzz uh, in in the community um, um, I, I I still think that uh, one of the one of the things that I kind of like it's the it's about the mindset you you, you said that uh, you need courage uh, definitely that I, I also think that the part of that is the uh, in a way, kind of like flexibility, uh, the uh, ability to react, kind of like that you see something happening and, and you can actually then kind of like quickly think that, okay, uh, is this a good thing? Is this, is this, is this a bad thing? Or uh, should we kind of like boost it or, or should we kind of like do something different? So uh, have a 
plan, but be ready to actually uh, do something different uh, from what you originally planned. Sounds like sounds like cool. game development. To well, me. That, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the core skills for all yes, developers. Yes, but in very kind of like a uh, uh, faster pace. Yeah, uh, even more. Say, even okay. even even faster pace. Yeah, one thing I learned from, uh, like I would say, one of the best uh, companies doing live ops is Space Ape, and they said that. There is a reason that they call it live ops and not scheduled ops. So it's like <laughs> things are happening live and you have to react. Yeah, yeah I think you covered it uh, really well. So I'll just yeah. summarize it in two yeah. words. So you have to be humble and nimble. Mm -hmm. so. Yes. <laughs> Maybe, uh, Emmy, you can take this stage and uh, explain right. how it is done in, in next games. Thank you. All right. So. Um, at Next Games, we make IP-based uh, games. So that means uh, mobile games that are based on like big uh, franchises, whether it's movies or TV shows or uh, books um, and you name it. Uh, and the biggest live game or the main live game that we have currently is The Walking Dead No Man's Land. And uh, that's been uh, out there for uh, two years now. And uh, we have said that we are releasing at least one new game per uh, year. So next up we have The Walking Dead Our World, which is coming soon, happening in the same uh, brand uh, universe of, of The Walking Dead. But it's kind of very new uh, angle and uh, kind of innovative gameplay with the location-based uh, uh, AR game. So stay tuned, there will be more news on that soon. And then we have also announced that we're working on a uh, game for uh, Blade Runner. Um, yes, yeah, so our biggest uh, game, which is the uh, official uh, mobile game for the AMC's uh, TV uh, series, the hit show, uh, The Walking Dead. And uh, it's been played by more than uh, 23 million players uh, so far. And uh, the game itself is uh, this kind of tactical turn-based combat, which uh, has like really uh, tight connections to the TV show, but we have also brought in there a lot of this kind of unique uh, new gameplay uh, as well. So you collect and upgrade your characters, you take them to missions and uh, challenges with you. And uh, the way we operate it is like that we have this uh, weekly cycle, so we have different uh, game modes and different challenges uh, like active and up and running at different uh, weekdays so that pl players get the habit on, on kind of what's happening at which day. And then, uh, of course, we have very kind of tight uh, integration with the TV show whenever uh, the show is out, live, uh, out there and the season, season is on. Um, we already talked a bit about the definition, so managing live games with ongoing support for listening and responding to player behavior. So this is uh, how we operate uh, games as live services. And the goal is to kind of uh, to have an engaging and continuously updated ex experience for a high uh, lifetime customer value. And here I'm not only talking about maximizing revenue, which is also nice, but the kind of main thing is uh, to have happy players. And, and that's really kind of where it comes, comes down to. And uh, we have the uh, benefit of having these kind of big fan audiences uh, of, of our franchises and IPs that we work with, and we're kind of taking them to this journey with us so that they can experience their favorite uh, moments and, and, and kind of uh, brands also in the forms of mobile games. And uh, also, of course, kind of running these live events, uh, sometimes very live, actual like real life events, but like what we're talking here now today is uh, the kind of in-game events is a kind of big part of it. And uh, there we already touched upon uh, the communication a bit. So one of the kind of key things there is really so that it's crystal clear to the player that what's the goal here? What are the short term, the long term goals for me? Like, why would I participate in this event? Like, what do I get out of it? So what, what do I need to do? And what's the reward that I get? And kind of communicating all of this, like it has to be really crystal clear and aligned with all the different teams. That, as you just heard, there's like a number of people uh, working with this events in the game company. So it's like a bit of a puzzle to keep it all together. Um, and it really has to start from the culture. So the way I like to see it is that we're building more than a game. We're building a relationship with our players. And in order to be able to build this long-term relationship, it really starts kind of 
from the culture of the company so that you think of it this from the beginning when you start to make the games and already kind of from the concept uh, ideas and prototyping. And of course you need to have the structure in place, like the right people, the kind of organization and, and like uh, basically the processes in order to do that. And the tech side so that you have the tools in place and uh, also analytics very much in the core of all of it. <clears throat> but in order to be able to then run the games as a service, you have to think of these already in the design phase, as Haney explained, like that as early as possible think that how is like my life going to be like when I actually have to operate this game and what are the tools and, and uh, kind of options that I have then. Uh, and then when you go to the soft launch, maybe close beta before that, like you really use that period in order to kind of fine tune and kind of test your processes because it will take time before you find out that what actually works for this game, this audience, this market situation and, and all these things that are in the play. And then you get to actually operate a, like a long living service for kind of games that last. And uh, this is uh, something that I'm sure a lot of you are, are familiar with, like how the life of cycle works. And uh, I just want to highlight one thing there, like when you deploy, whether it's an actual game feature or some kind of event or campaign or promotion or, or, or something that you kind of are, are pushing live, that already it, at that stage, like you have clear in your mind that what, what, what are my goals for this? Like, what's the target? What do I want to achieve? Like, do I want to get more engagement? Do I want to try to affect some like revenue metrics or, or what is it? And then you start to collect the feedback, you analyze the results, and then you compare to your hypothesis that, okay, did, did, did it happen what I was expecting? to happen here and what did we learn from here and like why did we actually not meet the targets or we did and and and, and what are the reasonings behind so it, it's it takes time to actually get the insights from all of this and then feed this information back to the development and uh, operations team and kind of keep uh, doing it so um, it's a creative industry, so the way I like to look at it is that we're creatively led, but definitely data informed. So data needs to be in the in, in the kind of core of it, but it, like it cannot like direct everything that you do. Um, and before we go to some concrete case examples uh, from uh, our games, uh, I just put this typology. Uh, here are some examples of uh, what type of events uh, you have, so a bit similar to what Haney mentioned. So the recurring events where you really kind of try to get these habits into the player's mind that, so that they know what to expect when and, and what do they get kind of when they return to the game at a certain uh, interval. Then the seasonal events that are these kind of bigger uh, kind of happenings uh, often during the holiday periods when people actually have time to play and maybe you can even get players back that, that stop playing for, for some reason. Um, and then uh, what I like to call, call the guerrilla events. So it's important that you also have events that are not pre-announced, like that they just come at uh, like a certain time so that uh, also mm, that there's things that the players are not uh, used to waiting for, like for example for uh, some uh, discounts or, or, or sales events so that, that they sometimes also kind of come as a surprise. And these are also like something that are, like everything of this can be react reactive and you have to adapt it based on the feedback that you get. But this is kind of even more reactive so that based on what your performance says, like then you have this toolbox that you can try out different things uh, to affect the numbers. And then of course, uh, like the ways to, promote new content or actually like maybe even more like features. So when you have some big uh, new elements coming out in the game, like that, what kind of event are you, are you planning around it in order to make the uh, most of it? Um, then uh, this is one example. So uh, from No Man's Land, so we really tightly integrate the game uh, into the TV show. So uh, when the season is on, we have this uh, weekly uh, content that uh, is released on, on Mondays and it uh, uh, kind of features the heroes that were prominent in the TV show and then the players play through the content uh, and then they get to unlock these he the, the heroes that have been prominent in the TV show. And uh, also what I like in this uh, example is that players get to like 
try out these heroes even if they don't have them yet so that then they kind of see how the gameplay is and, and, and then maybe perhaps uh, uh, get them later and get uh, more equipment to them as well. So there's of course always also additional things on top of the characters, although they are one of our kind of main things, but uh, like uh, additional gameplay and uh, weapons, armor and, and kind of events and, and bundles and offers related to this. And this is just some uh, uh, one example of, of, of the previous uh, example, the weekly uh, episodic uh, content where players kind of get to relive some of the moments that they have seen in the TV show. So here we see that it's more than 80% that engage with the content uh, as soon as it's uh, out there in the game. So uh, quite uh, engaging uh, results. And uh, another example, the Hero Week. So um, this is just to kind of portray how like everything that happens during one week revolves around a key character of the TV show. And uh, I have a, one example of a campaign that was, has been tied to this kind of weekly uh, uh, rhythm. So after the player got to unlock an Egan, who was in the previous slide, then we offer them a targeted uh, bundle where they can get an Egan special uh, weapon, the Bloody Lucille. So this is the sales curve here, the big uh, spike there that you see of, uh, of the sales of this item that when it was uh, offered to the uh, people who had just unlocked that uh, character. And one other reason why I wanted to show this to you, so this is the first like 48 hours. We don't always look at our data on a kind of hourly uh, level. Um, typically like we look at the data on a daily basis because that's the kind of the fastest that you can actually react to it. But like if there's a big campaign or a new feature or something interesting going out, we actually do look at it like an, uh, at an hour, hourly basis almost because you just are so excited to see kind of what's happening in the game, even though you don't necessarily act uh, on it uh, that fast. Uh, and then my last example of what we did uh, this previous uh, Christmas. So uh, the first week it was all revolving around uh, different heroes of the TV show. Then the second week we uh, unlocked a new hero. So there was a number of content that if you played through it all, then you were able to unlock uh, Jerry in the end. Then we had a update on the third week of December. So we are bringing new uh, features out in the game. So there was, for example, a revamped uh, daily missions uh, system. And then the fourth week of December, so the actual holiday season. So we had a lot of different things and events and promotions going on uh, every day in the game. And, and what's really important here to think that it's like, although it's mostly happening inside the game. So what's really important is that it's all reflected in the marketing materials, the user acquisition materials, so that it's all kind of consistently uh, in the communications inside and outside the game. All right, thank you. Uh, before we go, to, I have a question about the events, but before we go there, let's, uh, Emmy had a lot of, uh, you know, data on the slides. Uh, maybe open up a little bit, what are the kind of metrics, how do you measure the success of the live operations, how do you do it uh, hourly based or something else, and uh, what are the kind of key performance indicators in your games? Maybe iterate a little bit, Emmy, what it what are those and then others can also join yeah well i'm sure there's like everyone has the basic uh like uh, retention and and uh, revenue metrics and engagement and and all that but then it depends a bit of the event that you're running that what are the specific things that that you want to look at like there was an example that uh, for example of, of that one specific uh, like uh, weekly campaign that how many players have actually engaged with that one so we want to understand like the event specific things um, and uh, yeah, I guess it's really like the like macro level that you always look at this certain similar things and then the micro level that where you define it per uh, event that what you want to look at. So on a case, case by yeah. case uh, basis. How about you? Um? Yeah, so um, like metrics, uh, KPI perspective, it really depends on the event. 
So some of the events can be just uh, for uh, basically engagement. Uh, some events could be sort of like high intensity engagement, uh, some low intensity, um, basically just fun in a way. And then uh, of course, if, if, if you're doing like a really shop related event, then it's usually the KPI is, 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 is about uh, uh, revenue. So and purchase rates and that kind of stuff, but like um, it really depends on the event and there can be many kind of events. More concrete <laughs> ones from, <laughs> from Haiti? Well, I, maybe I, I could actually uh, mention the, uh, since, since I said earlier that uh, we are kind of like, we are still very much kind of like uh, in level business, uh, so that uh, the, how, how you actually uh, Progress also in the event is uh, getting through the levels, and uh, um, obviously we have the the big metrics. We look at the, um, for example, engagement, uh, the session uh, time, uh, even sessions per player, and, and that kind of stuff. But then we also, uh, when we when we do do have the levels uh, for the uh, for the events, we look at uh, very specifically uh, how those levels are doing. Uh, what is their kind of like the uh, for example, pass rate uh, and uh, how many tries. Uh, how how what is the boost to spend for for that level? Uh, how are actually uh, I, I mentioned that we are like uh, the in in our Christmas event are uh, the uh, events and and the levels in it were uh, sequential. Uh, so for us, it was really important to also see see and uh, kind of like validate that the players are actually uh, get. Uh, to the next events and, and uh, are able to progress in the whole campaign mm -hmm. and uh, that we have a kind of like our own expectations how it should work and, and then uh, we look at the data that I is it kind of like happening so and uh, if, if, if or when uh, we should react to that somehow. So it depends on the game and depends on what are your goals and, and what are the events that you're using. Are we looking at daily average users and monthly average users anymore? Is it is it still, is it kind of important also for the live operations? Yes, no? Um, I, I think that monthly uh, active users are probably more kind of like, almost like a, a vanity metric in, yeah. in, in that sense. I, I think that those are kind of like that, if, if you're thinking that in the end you are supposed to kind of like make the game better for your audience, then obviously you should see increase also in the in the kind of like bigger business level, yeah. uh, I think that uh, when it comes to the like the nitty gritty operations of the game, then it's it's probably very detailed. But I think that, that that's a fair point in that mm -hmm. you know you can have really fun with the game. The players can have really fun with the games, but if it's not showing uh, uh, somehow kind of like in in the uh, game game business. In the bigger then, numbers, yeah. then uh, we should probably think about changing something. Yeah, a lot of metrics and a lot of the things to look at and maybe tailor on your own processes. Was, would it be possible for you to share us what has been the most, if we talk about events, uh, what has been the most successful in terms of some of the metrics uh, as events in your games? Uh, what is something that you know that works or was really Nice example of working things. Well, Can you share us? I'll share one in the presentation. Okay. <laughs> so maybe we go to your presentation then, and then after that we talk more about the events. Yep. Should we do that? Yeah. Let's take Supercell and Lauric. Yes. So uh, yeah, Supercell uh, is a games company. <laughs> based in Helsinki. <laughs> yeah, let's go to the presentation. Actually, as a, like a visual guy, I don't have a, a super visual <laughs> uh, presentation. But the, uh, like, uh, I was thinking about it and then I thought that maybe this could be a pretty good angle. So um, if you think about uh, Clash Royale, which is the game I'm talking about, uh, it's, like a, it's a globally quite successful uh, real-time PvP game. Uh, how many of you actually have played Clash Royale? Quite many. How many of you have more than 3,000 trophies? 
Woohoo! <laughs> Good job. Um, yeah. So I wanted to ask because if, like how much I need to explain about the game. But yeah, Clash Royale. It's a real-time uh, PvP. Uh, nowadays, also multiplayer because you can, you can play two v two. Uh, and and uh, it is lo like happening in the Clash world, uh, which Clash of Clans was the original game. And um, sort of um, like the short history of Royal Live Ops, like when we, when we went live with the game, uh, there wasn't basically any Live Ops. Or well, the Live Ops was, I would say, uh, update every two and three months with new content. And that's sort of like, uh, in, in these days, that's not operating live. Um, but at that point, that, it actually worked really well because there was like lots of new content uh, in the game when we went live. Uh, then, uh, at some point, when we actually started working on uh, uh, like a daily service instead of like two or, or three month service, um, we started working on these like automated systems, uh, which I think is actually a really, really clever uh, way of thinking about live ops, even though some might say that it's not live ops for us, it, it is. Um, uh, triggering events. Uh, someone gets to a new arena, they get a new arena value pack, or uh, every weekend we have a clan chest in the, in the clan, which is, which is an event eventually. But they are something that uh, you don't need like uh, manual operations all the time, but you can still tweak things live if needed. Then uh, from that we went to, uh, I would say, hard-coded special events when we didn't have any sort of like live ops personnel or team, um, and uh, eventually, I think it was uh, 2006, in the end of 2016, so not like a little bit over a year ago, we actually uh, created a um, tool, internal tool, how we can op operate the game live. Uh, so it wasn't in the beginning when the game was uh, designed, uh, live ops wasn't like designed into it, so we've been sort of like putting it on top of it, but uh, um, after, after, after the tools, tools game, it's been sort of like really like a good part of the, uh, the important part of the uh, game development. And uh, yeah, then what came out of it? Uh, in the game, we have these challenges, basically maybe once, twice a week, usually every weekend, we have a, a different kind of challenges uh, with different game modes, uh, not just 2v2 and touchdown. There's actually, um, I think, maybe 17 different game modes uh, sort of on the core game that we can use. Uh, then uh, at some point we uh, added quests, which is also uh, a system uh, that doesn't need uh, like people. People in the team uh, working on them, they, they work pretty much automatically. And uh, uh, as an example, there's like actually lots of different events uh, also happening in the shop. But one example here is boosts. Um, people can get boosts uh, to uh, get uh, sort of extra victory gold when they play in 1v1 ladder and, and such. But this is like uh, where we ended up in about a year, so the development has been pretty pretty fast. Yeah, and then uh, at Supercell we don't have processes, so the process is um, pretty simple in a way. So uh, we have a roadmap in the team. Um, we might know, in some cases we know a little bit further, but uh, in some cases we might know like two weeks ahead uh, what's going to happen in the game. Um, we try to listen to the community, uh, how they feel about different things and, uh, and uh, react uh, on the roadmap. Then uh, we built internal live ops tools um, uh, so we can create the events pretty easily. And uh, the idea is that the, like the development, core development team doesn't have to be involved. Uh, it's uh, guys like me <laughs> who, can who can work with the tools and uh, and uh, uh, create the events uh, and tweak quite many numbers. Um, and uh, eventually it, it ends up in the game. Um, uh, that's actually lots of manual work. 
uh, lots of creative work behind it, which is pretty cool. Um, then part of the process is marketing. So I would say like already in the game UI, uh, lots of things we are indicating that there, there's uh, uh, an event happening in the game. Then we have an like internal news channel in the game called News Royale. Uh, we tell about the, the upcoming events or ongoing events, uh, use push notifications, notify players that there's something special happening in the game. Uh, of course, like all the own channels. And we also do lots of re-engagement uh, marketing when there is something new in the game and uh, we have a uh, like bunch of churned players. We try to tell them that, hey, maybe now it's the time to come back to the game because there's something eventful happening in the game. Um, yeah, the, the global game aspect. Uh, so Clash Royale works in a way that we don't have any like separate server shards. Every single player plays the same game. And we think that's actually quite cool. Uh, you know, Japanese player can play against a Finnish player. And uh, it's, a, uh, it's also when we think about the, the live ops perspective, um, sort of the, the, the easy way of thinking would be just like uh, doing separate things in separate, separate uh, markets and, and countries like China, Japan, uh, huge markets. Uh, but we, st we are still operating on, on, the, on the global level. And uh, it means that our live ops perspective, it's not like we're not actually doing that many events. Uh, like the idea is that there's always something like, that the players would feel that there's always like a, an interesting event coming. So the eventfulness can also come from waiting something to happen. It doesn't have to be eventful all the time. And uh, uh, that's a uh, pretty much like a little bit like Western market kind of perspective. And uh, it's a challenge. We're actually uh, thinking about it a lot, like how to make things more local. But it is a challenge. Like if you, if you would have a global game, I think that's one of the biggest decisions in the begin, like beginning, like how you are going to treat the players. Uh, is it like globally fair or like putting, putting uh, things into sort of like market perspective? Uh, and we have strong local communities, so there has to be lots of communication to, you know, like Brazil, uh, China, Japan, Korea, uh, English community, um, and uh, every single community ha like has their own things. So, uh, and by the way, I counted 20 different languages, so every single event that, that is done. But that also happens in the tool side, which we are going to talk about like after this one. So. Uh, so um, like, like thinking about how to create tools uh, that actually support operating globally. In our case, it's like a automatic localization translation system that uh, if we do something, we, we get, get it localized really quickly. So it doesn't slow us, slow us down. Um, yeah, this was the joke I told earlier. One guy first, then. The other one came and the department grew double. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. One was laughing. And um, no more. Um, so we believe in the small team, but it needs uh, like lots of support outside of the team. In our case, it's uh, two people working on live ops in the, in the game team of 18 people. Um, of course, lots of people helping, uh, giving feedback in the team, but it means that there's a, a, like you need support from outside. Uh, and in some cases, you need to be really like really able to sort of like produce things uh, outside of the team, uh, figure out ways to do, do things as quickly as possible. And uh, maybe decide uh, like live ops system where it doesn't rely on like, uh, uh, for example, in our case, we don't have skins in the game, at least yet. And uh, it's like, if, if there would be that kind of, that kind of thing in Royale, it would mean that uh, uh, it's, it's, it's actually pretty hard to do in, in, in the game team where we have uh, three artists. So, so uh, that it's like decisions, decisions kind of thing. But we do truly believe that the small team actually get, like keeps the game. So that we can do decisions like this. It's, it's a good thing. 
Um, yeah, this is the thing I wanted to mention about. So one of the coolest things that I think we've done uh, using LiveOps is um, like last August we created uh, a 20 win challenge uh, in-game qualifier uh, for this thing called Crown Championships, which uh, ended up being like the World Champ Championships of Clash, Clash Royale. And uh, the finals were played in London. There were 16 people playing in the finals. So um, from numbers perspective and from engagement perspective, uh, like uh, it was just one of the coolest things that we feel that we've done is that when, when, uh, when the challenge was over, there was 27.4 different participants, uh, 4 million different participants uh, in, in, in the challenge. And uh, it, it, like, it felt like, uh, like narrowing down from that amount of people using our sort of live ops tools without actually having to do, do much, much of this um, sort of like extra planning, uh, uh, we managed to pull this out. Uh, and and uh, this is something that I think all the games should do more, try to, try to create ex experiences that actually grow like outside of the game in a way. So, so that's, that's maybe the best example of, of the live ops stuff that we have done. Special live ops that needs manual work from two people. Uh, yeah, I guess this is the last slide, if I'm right. Yes. Thank you. Well, I think that is a very special event, so not, maybe not all the mobile uh, game <laughs> developers can do and create such events. Maybe other successful events also from the Rovio and uh, Next Games. I actually also have in mind a pretty uh, special event mm -hmm. uh, and not actually from our game uh, or our games but uh, from the RPG Studios game uh, which we uh, ran um, for the Halloween and that was uh, the collaboration with Iron Maiden. <laughs> uh, but I think that that also goes to the, uh, to the category of uh, these are great events, but uh, they are kind of like the, you know, almost like creme de la creme events. Yeah, but yeah. I think that uh, for us, it's, it's really important that we also kind of like do those type of events because uh, um, they are not only uh, really, really fun for the players. Uh, um, we, we knew uh, or could see from the data that uh, that actually would probably go down pretty well, uh, that the the audience of the game uh, is also fans uh, of the band, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and they wanted to uh, do a collaboration uh, with us. But um, what kind of like also made it successful is that it did work in the game, but it also uh, worked in the, in the marketing and, and PR. And I think that that is something that, uh, especially when you kind of like you grow bigger and bigger, which I think that uh, all of the companies and other games that we are now uh, talking here is that uh, you also in the live ops, you want to look at the kind of like bigger business. Uh, how, how can you actually utilize it in, in many different fronts and uh, tie the marketing into it, tie the community and, and, and so forth. Yeah, so, it's, uh, it's really, it feels really important that there's like part of the eventfulness is yes about getting the players actually wait for something big to happen in a way. So it's, that's, uh, that, is, that is important and that's good for retention. Is that, do you agree with the, with the rest of the panelists, Emi? Yes, so of course it's very nice to get to do this like not once in a lifetime, but maybe <laughs> once, <laughs> once a year or once every six months type of events. But um, for us also, like if you think of the day-to-day -day stuff, like the most successful ones are the ones that are really tightly integrated with the uh, IP and, and, and the franchise. And, uh, and I guess that's, that's a bit of a, sp a special angle with us. Uh, and other than that, I think there's just a, a few things that normally like define uh, successful events like 
one thing that's really important, uh, at least uh, what we've noticed, is that it has to be like time limited. So um, that you really kind of motivate your players to come and uh, do that, <laughs> like a certain thing, whatever the goal is in the event at, at, at a specific time. And uh, I don't know if that's something that do you mostly do time lim limited events as well? Yeah, and I, yeah. I think that that's kind of like that's also partly related into how how the kind of like the the lives are being lived <laughs> nowadays. Mm. It's kind of like that. It's, it's very hard for me to you know commit to something that is happening for you know six months or a year or, or that I, I like that there are also bigger goals but then it's like it's easier if I see something that okay there's something for the you know that I, I need to spend a lot of time for during the weekend for example or, or during one week and that is something that uh, the you can kind of like commit to and uh, then work towards that. Uh, but if it's, 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 it's important that it's kind of like concrete enough and uh, that usually the, the uh, having the time limit also helps. Hmm. Yeah. So something special that only happens for a certain time yeah. uh, in the game. So I really want to go there now. So that would be one of the pulls, right? Yeah. yeah. Or something yeah. once in a lifetime. And like also kind of like the fear of missing out that, okay, oh, yeah. it's, it's now or, or then it's never. Yeah, you get some yeah. special rewards that you can get in any other way than I mean, being there at that point. Is that, or is that the most important thing or is there different kinds of events? I mean, uh, is, is all of the events something that needs to be, needs to feel special and big and uh, something that will go away and you'll miss out? Or is there something routine based things that people kind of can resort to that they go back to the game and they see their favorite things? How does it, how the balance between these? Because you know, we, we love the Iron Maiden things and, and the, the big championships things and the kind of showmanship that we can create with games and uh, make hybrids between other uh, entertainment. But how about the daily kind of just pushing the, the, the buttons in games? Yeah, maybe. Uh, like, um, like, I believe that the actual core game still is that thing in a way to act like that people want to come back again and again and again. And if we think about the core game as, uh, uh, as the branch uh, of the tree and then sort of eventfulness uh, or events are, are then, uh, oh yeah, so uh, the other way, around. that's the trunk and then events are the, are the branches. So, um, so um, it's really important that the core game itself works really well and then uh, uh, sort of Events uh, that are tied to the core game uh, probably might work the best, yeah. uh, but but it's still good to have these branches uh, that sort of like take you away from the core game every now and then, and and gives 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 the players the feeling that uh, uh, there is also something else else happening. Maybe that's like a really good way to put it. And then uh, yeah, I I I do believe that. Um, concentrating on sort of those smaller things on daily basis uh, is really important, but you have to be able to sort of uh, spice it up. Not, not like a, even like, like weekly basis or monthly basis, but like uh, for, for long-term players, you need to spice it up every now and then. Mm. All right. Um I think that um, we could go and uh, discuss a little bit about the tools. So in order to keep the game running, uh, everything is not invented and kind of created uh, ad hoc, but you have tools to help that. So for instance, can you give us examples of the content creating tools, creating to, uh, creation tools or other tools that help you keep the, the game kind of running and, and uh, uh, players coming back? What do you use? How do you do that? Do you build your own? Or do you utilize something that is available elsewhere? I, I think that for us, it's it's pretty much uh, the kind of like the tools that we've built uh, during the uh, game development um, um, uh, production uh, process. And um, I, I could also be quite honest here. I, I think that uh, we still have fairly young game in in that sense when we think of for example ab ab match um, that uh, we we know that 
if we want to go kind of like more lean, then I think that uh, some of the stuff uh, could also be streamlined uh, when it comes to the tools. But uh, at the moment, we rely pretty uh, heavily still uh, on the on the kind of like the whole team uh, that they can uh, they can do uh, some things if if needed. Um, so mainly working with the um, you know configuration files and uh, and 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 then obviously for example the graphical assets uh, are kind of like then um, put in into the game um, uh, either with the builds or then as as downloadable assets. How is it for you? Uh, yes, we also have uh, in-house built uh, tools and uh, for the content management and also like how you operate the values of the game uh, and, and kind of the key thing there is to for the tools to be built as flexible as possible so that it's easy to kind of change the like values and, and the timings and the goals and, and, and the rewards and, and everything that, that you need to change in an event. But uh, in the same way, like I think this is something that you kind of need to keep improving on um, so that we, we are also kind of keep improving the tools according to the needs and when we have new, new games coming, coming out so that we, we get the tools to uh, scale with the game. So, so it's kind of work in progress uh, in that sense. Um, and then also very importantly, the analytics tools uh, related to all of this. So, so there, I think it's it's a big question that do you want to develop your own or uh, use uh, some of the BI platforms and, and tools that are out there. So we have uh, built our own and it's working like extremely well for us. Um, I've seen a number of both in-house builds and, and uh, like a, a vendor provided uh, uh, analytics uh, platforms and, and tools and, and that's, that, that's, that's kind of a big decision and, and for a startup I definitely wouldn't recommend of, of building your own but uh, for us it, it has worked uh, very well that, that we have built our own analytics tools as well so then there kind of everything is in sync with the, with the live tools as well. Yeah the same thing with us that actually most of the tools are built internally. Um, it has uh, like it's actually a really, really good choice for us. Um, if I think about we want to do something in the game and uh, it's not doable uh, in, in the tools, uh, we can just make it happen. Um, uh, like uh, by developing the tool ourselves. Um, there are a few like, for example, like I talked about the roadmap earlier. I think um, just there's so many like basic calendar solutions that can be used um, for like any company basically. And uh, I'm not so familiar with the, sort of the possibilities of out, like outsourcing live ops tools, but I've heard that there are some. <laughs> uh, I think that's something that maybe like if you are really interested in this live ops topic, like you are, um, um, that's a, an interesting thing to sort of look for. Like there might be actually really good tools available for outsourcing if you think about your own games or something like that. Um, yeah, but for us, it is uh, both the analytics, like everything is sort of like plugged into this this one tool. Uh, that we can use for operating the game live, but and it's it's sort of like separate from the it, we like the game team is part of developing the tool, uh, sort of integrating everything in the, uh, to the tool if we create something new in the game, um, but otherwise it's uh, it's uh, sort of the tool is developed by another team, like horizontal team at Supercell. Uh, uh, and everything is like all, also the data uh, automatically the data gets analyzed for each each event to a, to a form that it's sort of like easily readable um, yeah what would be the ideal situation I mean this is 
uh, something that is developing all the time. And uh, maybe uh, us in the game industry, we think that everything is moving so fast and changing, so we don't do kind of that long uh, investments in things. But what would be the ideal situation with, in terms of the tools? That you would have uh, maybe service provider or you would have more people working on, on the tool, or how does it work? Uh, what would you really like to improve in this field in terms of the whole game industry? Would you still want to keep it just uh, internal or just to...? Uh... Uh, I think that that's a great question. I, I, I like, um, for example, as, as Emmy said, that uh, starting like the startups, when, when they start, uh, definitely uh, rely on the, uh, uh, the tools that are already kind of like out there. But I, yeah. I, I would still think that at some point uh, when, when you start to kind of like, you've kind of like, you are doing the basic thing, uh, you are configuring some of the stuff, uh, you are seeing uh, some of the analytics. I think that uh, then if your game is kind of like really, really successful, uh, you want to start doing more and, and go kind of like deeper. And, mm -hmm. and then I think that uh, you, you start hitting the, also the limits of the kind of like uh, ready-made tools. Yeah. Uh, and unless you have really, really good relationship uh, with the uh, uh, tool provider or they have a model where you can actually then pay extra to get that tool kind of like develop further, then um, I, I think that then you need to kind of like uh, have the kind of like decision that uh, is this limiting my ability to actually operate the game mm -hmm. and should we actually then uh, to, think to make the creative the decisions. Yeah. 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 Will there be like a unity of live operations in metrics and analytics? Or will it be in unity? I don't know how it, <laughs> what is the future? At least there will be something. <laughs> I don't know if it's, uh, yeah, it, it really, because I think every game's sort of needs are really different, or mm -hmm. at least like every type of game's needs are really different, so. Yeah, I think there's going to be more and more of, of the kind of providers out there, but this is really such an integral part of the business that mm -hmm. I, at least for uh, even slightly bigger gaming companies, I think it's also difficult to, like make the decision that is this something I want to outsource or mm. do I want to have all the flexibility uh, that yeah. I can myself. But then there is the balance that, okay, that if it's the same people, whether they are making the kind of game features or, or the platform tools, like how do you prioritize? I think it's, it's always, always uh, tricky to find the balance there. And also like there's so many things that you like, uh, if you have the freedom to actually develop your own tool, you have so many ideas. And it's more mm. like, uh, it's also like prioritizing the ideas yeah. into the sort of minimum viable to, uh, yeah, there's, um, with the tool development itself, you can, you can get into a situation where you just like keep developing the tool and uh, you notice that, hey, we haven't used half of the <laughs> features in a way. So, so um, yeah, so if you end up developing your own tool, just keep heavily prioritizing what is actually needed yeah. and uh, also like what is uh, for like with live ops i think one of the best things is that uh, the games can actually test a lot of things you know uh, um, i would presume that for example uh, puzzle games can do lots of a b testing between like what works and what doesn't work for a global uh, real-time pvp it's not so easy as easy but it's like uh, um, all these uh, live ops tools already create you a possibility to to sort of learn really quickly, mostly from mistakes. How about the A/B testing? Like um, in puzzle games, easier. Uh, maybe not in uh, in uh, Supercell's uh, products. Uh, how is it for next games? Uh, how much do you do? A, A, A and B or A and B and C and D testing. How, how, is, how does it uh, work together with the uh, live operations? Yes, that's a really like important uh, tool for us. And uh, in the ideal world, I would just like to test test everything. But of, of, of course, you can't uh, do that so often. Kind of with the time pressure, like you may just put the feature live and then see how it performs. 
Uh, but we have been with, with some of our recent features, we, we have been doing a, a B test where we actually like bring out a new feature only to a certain group and, and test that and it's really super valuable feedback that you get from there. So, so if you find the kind of time and capability to actually test features on top of just some like prices or, or like value testing, it, it, it can be super valuable for you. And that's something we're doing. How do you do it in Rovio? How much are A-B testing? Is, or is it we, like we, which yeah. ones are for A-B testing and which uh, things are not for that? Uh, we do A-B test a lot. And uh, I, I think that the tricky part there is actually that uh, the things that are really, really easy to A-B test are, are most often also the things that are in the end don't have that huge value. Mm. Uh, so I, I think that uh, it's like once you... Once you actually uh, start A-B testing, I, I think that you should uh, not just do it for the kind of like just for the kind of like fun of testing. Uh, that you know, it would be interesting to see if this is better or this one. But does actually... that happen? Do you do this kind of a fun <laughs> testing? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I actually I, I don't know if, if the, the teams are doing it or not. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think that it's it's important also to then have kind of like hypothesis that you actually test things that you think that uh, then have an impact mm. uh, when you kind of like find out that yeah. uh, uh, do the players kind of like uh, do it this way or this way or mm. is this preferred to, to this one or if I change it this way, do does it, you know, increase uh, retention? Mm. Uh, so money is important, yeah. resources, yeah. Yeah, it's easy to get sidetracked with A-B testing, so mm. it's super important that you define that, okay, I want to look at this and maybe this other metric uh, and not just like let's look at all the metrics when mm. when the A/B test results come, so that you need to have the hypothesis that that you want to test and validate exactly as you said. Does the live game kind of uh, become a game to the dev team or the live operations team itself when you look at the data and you try to kind of see what uh, how the system works like in the early the, days the, of the, games? Yeah, <laughs> I, I think that that's that's actually very well put. Yeah. I think that it's it's kind of like that it it is your kind of like playground and yeah. and and you look at the, the data and and try to kind of like understand and you don't know the rules yet for yeah. like how does the game is kind of put there yeah. so that like I actually I I, I was thinking the, this when I looked at them is uh, slides of the hourly based data so I can I can uh, imagine this enjoyment of getting the the kind of uh, one of the versions out there or one of the features and then you try to see what happens <laughs> in the in the in the players field so that's Definitely. that's one probably one of the best parts of the of the doing live operations that you see what happens yeah, like con yeah. yeah. concurrent going up that's uh, yeah. that's one of the best <laughs> feelings yeah. yeah so a and b testing is is when you put uh, one version and the other version you see how these different versions work for example, uh, the one one area where we do uh, and, and have been doing A/B testing uh, for for a long time already is actually the uh, level difficulty. Mm, uh, for right. example, that kind of like trying to find the the uh, optimal balance uh, for them to be kind of like uh, enough challenging uh, for the uh, for the players to actually get some kind of like challenge and and uh, also to monetize, but then uh, not be kind of like to uh, too overwhelming where they then uh, leave the game mm. uh, completely. How about player typologies? Do you have that kind of uh, as a also guiding principle? Do you think about what kind of type of players you have and uh, how does it affect on the live operations? Do you do, for instance, kind of segmenting things and uh, different things? Like Laura said that the game is same for everybody, but, but um, do you somehow utilize this kind of information perhaps on you probably know your players very well and, and what kind of groups there are? How does it help their live operations? We don't necessarily do it in, in such way that the game experience uh, would be kind of like very different for, for different players. But uh, what, we, what we do do, for example, um, I explained that uh, when we look at the uh, campaigns and events and, and how the players are actually uh, kind of like going through that event. We, we know that those are that are the kind of like the most hardcore players and, and fans that they, they are the ones who 
um, always kind of like consume the, the you know uh, the the content uh, first, and they are there kind of like uh, waiting for the next event to unlock, um, and and then uh, we do have the players who are kind of like coming at a bit kind of like slower pace. And uh, if we see that, or if we want to kind of like somehow help those players, then we don't kind of like necessarily change the game rules, but uh, that they, it would be a lot easier the game, but we kind of like offer them something uh, that the other players could also get if they are still playing uh, that part of the level. For example, the um, you know, infinite lives uh, drop rate from the uh, chests are uh, higher for the weekend and and that way uh, the the also the players that are a bit b behind can catch up mm, with the right. other players so so we know that there are different uh, type of players uh, in the game and different segments and uh, we we look at them uh, but it depends a lot uh, then from the kind of like game uh, game situation in the game and the feature of the game what we kind of like do with that information. Mm. Do you do this kind of thing in, in Supercell? We, uh, in, in Royale, uh, we actually run like some of the events we, we run just for players that have gone like past, uh, it's a, in our case it's XP8. Um, mm -hmm. Since then it, it, it puts the players on like more, le more level playground in a way. Um, and also some events like for lower level players. So at least that kind of segmenting we're doing, yeah. and uh, it would be interesting to do do it more. But uh, yeah, it's, it's it's pretty tricky when you try to set like a fair play for <laughs> for everybody, for global play, yeah, global audience. Yeah, so yeah, how is it with next uh, and and the special Walking Dead? There is a different audiences, obviously. Yes, uh, and it, it is quite a broad audience as well. So um, we know that we have some more uh, competitive oriented players, but then we also have players who are very like story uh, oriented, um, and uh, most of our like super engaged players are fan also fans of the TV show. But then we also have uh, players who are just fans of like turn-based uh, RPG type of games, so, so we know that there's a lot, of, a lot of different segments in the game. But um, one example how uh, we also take it into account is like last year we introduced a feature to the people in the end game. Um, so that it was also visible only uh, when, when you reached a certain uh, level. Um, and then uh, we kind of tested it there and then we saw that okay that uh, players who are kind of also kind of in, in the mid game might be interested in this this feature so we or this it was like a new game mode uh, so then we brought it also to them but with a kind of uh, less challenge uh, like a e easier settings so um, there are kind of certain things that are are visible to different segments in the game but but I, I think that's something that we like you, you can always kind of go deeper and, and do more of that, that do, as well. do you see it from the metrics like what, like how do you find out what kind of players do you have is it like uh, intuition or how do you do like a research on that or just look at your numbers or yeah the, uh, we the look feedback? at the numbers and we do focus groups and we have this uh, kind of VIP group of uh, some uh, super engaged uh, players and guild leaders uh, that we actually have a like a, a communication channel uh, directly with them and uh, we also may test uh, like some uh, new features with them beforehand so that's super valuable uh, feedback on top of the forums and, and, and kind of the regular community uh, channels. One, one really kind of like uh, useful tool for us has been that uh, we are able to run these kind of like in-game uh, short surveys uh, mm -hmm. where we uh, ask about the different kind of like uh, campaign or, or event or some new feature uh, from the player and, and then we can actually uh, tie that data into the kind of like the, the RBI data of, of that player uh, so we can then kind of like see that okay um, these kind of like um, players for example who are spending this much they were thinking this about this feature and, mm. and that kind of stuff. Uh, so that that at, at least for us uh, that has been really useful. It's kind of like it's it's easy for the players to, you know, answer. Uh, it's it's usually just uh, 
one max, kind of like two screens, uh, and, um, and and that's it. And, and then we get a, a lot of valuable data. Also from the uh, uh, App Store reviews, uh, I think that, uh, and, and the uh, Facebook page, I think that uh, uh, all of our communities are probably pretty active in, in, in that sense as well, that we get a lot of feedback uh, from there. So it's really being on the skin of the players so that Definitely. you know your players well and you know how to kind of uh, how to make the more, a game more meaningful for different players at the same time for different kinds of players, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's um, sort of at least how we think in, in, in our game team that there's like a it's combination of, of the community sort of mood and reactions and that kind of stuff and then sort of like the real data <laughs> and uh, um, in some cases the community reactions are much more important than the real data yeah. uh, and then it's also even like us in the team as as royal players there's like different like different like m quite many are pretty high uh, sort of more hardcore players i would say but we have ca casual players too so it's actually really good to think about all those perspectives like if you go full to the community it's usually quite sort of like hardcore kind of point of view, but you, and you need to think about the whole player base in a way. Yeah, definitely. It's, yeah. I mean, uh, at least for, for us, and I think that uh, kind of like uh, it comes as a surprise for the, for the many people that I talk with, is that uh, in the casual puzzle games, you actually have hardcore players there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that um, I think that it was just uh, during the, uh, for example, our, our Christmas campaign, that uh, we saw on our Facebook page, uh, where somebody had actually made an Excel sheet of mm. uh, <laughs> the the campaign uh, and, and all the kind of like that. Uh, what are the stuff that needs to be done for, in order to actually get all these things? Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. I, I think that it's it's like it's they are definitely taking it uh, seriously. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Like hey, hey, they has hardcore yeah. players. <laughs> yeah. Why wouldn't it have? Of course it has. <laughs> let's, uh, let's take a couple of questions from the audience um, or from the stream. Perhaps there has been questions uh, on the stream. So wait for the, like, raise your hand and wait for the microphone to come to you. Do we have any questions to the panelists? Okay, here is one question. Uh, can we get the mic here? Just a second. It was here, there. Can you please stand up so that we can... Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, what is the steps that you take when you want to add a new event to your game? What is the questions that you ask yourself whether this is a good event or not, whether it's going to change the game design probably and uh, the, my second question is that what is the biggest uh, game design uh, side uh, ch decision that you have made based on the results of your live ops so the first question was that uh, what is the steps that you take when you want to add uh, a new event to your live ops now how do you decide on the on the new event? Yeah, what, whether yeah. it is it is a good event or not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, okay. I can start with the first one. So um, yeah, usually how it happens is that uh, like one of the, our team members uh, has an idea and then they put in put it in our uh, development build and then we play it and it's fun <laughs> and then it ends up in the game. <laughs> That's actually quite uh, like normal story. Uh, and usually when the players really enjoy something, then it's sort of like all the KPIs just uh, uh, work. So maybe not the most scientific thing, but, <laughs> but that's usually how it happens in our team. And yeah. Yeah, we also do a lot of uh, internal testing um, in the company. Um, uh, and. Uh, then the kind of next step is, is uh, that some of the things we bring to external testing as well, but not, not of course for every event. <laughs> that, that would be a bit of a overkill, but uh, yeah, definitely it's a lot about testing that what works and not. And then like if a certain type of event works, then like you try to maybe make something a bit similar, but with different values or like slightly tweaking it. Um, and it can feel like a all brand new event, even though the kind of core 
uh, mechanics would be actually very similar. Yeah. So you already know what works and then that kind of helps yeah. your decision on that. Yeah, yeah or, or the other way around that we, we know that something is, is not working yeah. and, and then we can like try yeah. to think that, okay, how would this work? And uh, then uh, doing the design based, based on that. And um, I think one, one good thing about the um, events is that uh, since they are kind of like time limited and, and actually in the game uh, only limited time, then I think that you can also be a bit more brave uh, mm -hmm. when designing them. Because uh, if it's not working, then just get it out and, and not yeah. use it again. Of course, there's also kind of like the opportunity cost, but uh, and hopefully it's, it's don't break the economy <laughs> while doing it. So. Well, you are. You are, you are, you know, breaking the economy only temporarily. Uh, I think that's, then, then yeah. you can still kind of like recover from that. Yeah. But I think that's, uh, that's actually, uh, I would definitely say that it's, it's one of the kind of like most fun things uh, in the live operations. And, and when you can like design uh, the uh, events uh, mm. for the game that uh, you can like, that it's, you, you can also have fun. It's that. fun to be brave and just yeah, uh, try yeah. something and then learn from that yeah. and not to yeah. break the economy while you're doing that, hopefully. Yeah. And uh, yeah. actually, uh, one, one thing that uh, I, I, I learned uh, from some, uh, one of our product leads uh, who used to work um, uh, at Wuga uh, was that uh, how they actually uh, developed uh, new game features was that they first uh, put them out as kind of like uh, limited uh, time events. Mm. And uh, then if they see that that was working, then they developed it further uh, and, and uh, put it as a kind of like, uh, kind of like then uh, part of the, the whole game. Mm. Uh, so how about the biggest change in design that was kind of live operations driven or data driven? Yeah, uh, that was like when you uh, just came into my mind that actually um, now if you open the game, Clash Royale, there used to be the battle button, just the, the yellow battle button, but now it has also 2v2, so that was originally Live Ops. So um, created as a uh, time-limited event, and uh, then we just liked it, and the players liked it, so we put it there permanently. <laughs> so, so yeah, I guess that's it for Royale. Emmy, do you have any examples from the? Yeah, I'm just thinking game? because um, I have not been that long in the company yet, so I've heard that there's been like during the two years that the game has been live that there there's a ton, ton of examples, but I like I can't say say now that what would be the the biggest one, but um, but, but this the, happens anyway. Yeah, this also yeah, happens, definitely, yeah. and and also like in the way that uh, that's something that works in the events that then can inform the actual mm. uh, features. And uh, we are also using it uh, cross game, uh, so that uh, since our, our audience in the in, with the puzzle games uh, is is you know fairly uh, similar, uh, we we usually how how we do it uh, is that uh, if if we have some ideas and and then one game is actually ready to build something, uh, then uh, they 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 take it and and they build it and, and test it in their game and and then uh, if it works. Um, then the other games can actually uh, then take it and, and use it as such, or, or then mm. can like make their own modification. Mm. Um, so even though we it. we have the tools for metrics and analytics, but it's not like a magic wand that you would be able to know all the things that we didn't know before. The games were constantly online, so that's kind of uh, the usual business still. And then you just gradually learn yeah. from different things and from friends as well. Mm. So it's not only yeah. just just internally but definitely yeah and the tools can be actually a really good restriction also like creatively in a way so like, you know that you don't have time uh, from developers on something but you have to you want to create something really cool and then you just have to figure it out how it's doable with the existing tools right and that's always right. like a nice challenge yes was there another question from the audience we have time for one more there is one. Uh, so how I, how I see it, usually events in mobile games are like you play an event and then you get a reward. Of course, you could do without. But uh, I think more interesting is uh, how do you make the reward desirable to the players? Because uh, I know that 
for example, you can enable player player trading and that makes them see, whoa, he wants to trade with me, so my stuff really is worth something. Usually you don't have that. So how do you create a feeling of value? Value for the players. Yeah, so um, you actually mentioned the right thing, like feeling of value. So um, actually, if you if you look at the rewards, uh, of course, there's like lots of uh, sort of tools to uh, figure out what is right kind of reward for each event uh, and uh, sort of thinking about the intensity, maybe in, uh, in our case, like thinking about the sort of uh, also like um, a attend fee for the event. Um, but it, it is like uh, basically testing with the tools and uh, uh, like, like looking at how the event actually looks in the game and when you play it, how it like play test it, how it feels and how it would feel to get the reward in a way. So it's, it's like, uh, I would say, really manual kind of process and you just have to know when it feels right and uh, in our case it, it is mostly like a feedback loop in the team in a way so like does this does these rewards feel feel good for the player so so it's once again maybe a little bit scientific in the beginning but in the end it is about the feeling of, of how, how it how it is and looks yeah i tend to agree and even if you know your own game uh, inside and out like you don't always get it right so yeah. we do get feedback from the players that hey like uh, this didn't feel exactly like what i ex would have expected for uh, this event but then luckily rewards is something that you can tweak uh, quite easily so so like definitely li listen to our players there because we, we can't get it right always uh, first yeah for first time and for royal players it can be like there's players who really just love to open the chest as a reward and then there's players who don't want the chest they just want the gold for upgrades so it's like a sort of uh, you know you bow on the other direction and yes <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one one kind of like additional thing is is that um, for us it's it's also about kind of like uh, how do we support kind of like the, the player building a relationship with the game and, and kind of like building that as a kind of like uh, almost like a, a story with that game uh, so that when we do uh, different type of events they, they also kind of like work as a um, in, in kind of like as a uh, memento from that uh, event for example that they participated. And it can be really kind of like that. It doesn't need to be expensive or anything, uh, but that they, they just get something that uh, reminds them about that uh, certain event uh, that they participated in. I, I remember the time of a certain era of Facebook games, which is not there anymore, that the kind of a presence of friends, the friends bar was really meaningful for people, even though we wouldn't play like a player versus player, but just to know that the others are playing. Is this still kind of valid or important in the in the kind of a mobile games that are online constantly you see if the other player is doing something if your friends are also participating to the game is this one of the things that kind of creates also value for the Definitely. players yeah. yeah and i think that uh, i i did mention in 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 my slides that i think that for the for the puzzle games casual puzzle games i think that we could do much more and uh, that I, I think that that part is still somehow in in that kind of like uh, era where you did see your Facebook friends, and and you know you you saw if if you got a higher score from a certain level than they did, but and then you could you know exchange lives and and things like that. But I think that uh, what we are seeing in in games, you know, such as. Uh, you know, flash or kind of like, uh, like from kind of like the, those social features, uh, whether it's about the competition or just kind of like socializing or strategizing uh, with the other players. I think that they are way more uh, important mm. uh, or be, have become kind of like more and more important also uh, for us to look at. And like uh, yeah. at once again, looking at, uh, to uh, like many Chinese games, uh, 
just so like amazing social systems in a way. So uh, I think we all have lots to learn from that. Right. Yeah, those are really the ones uh, that are super powerful for the long-term re retention. I really liked your day, day 1000. Uh, so um, yes, yeah. yeah, the kind of end game and uh, well, the social features, like we have the guilds, uh, but uh, like the more you can build around the kind of social features, the kind of stronger the bond is to the game and, and uh, the kind of longer players stay. And The Walking Dead, you see a spike after an episode, right? The, the content is um, uh, together with the, with the actual TV show. So yes. you see a spike right after when the episode has come out, right? Yes, so players play the kind of con um, episode related content right. uh, very actively right after when it's out. Yeah. Do, do you see like on the forums that they also talk about the TV show so that it kind of woves, wovens into the, the, the whole community of the, of the game? Yes. So our kind of most dedicated players definitely are, are super fans of, of, of the TV show uh, often as well. And it's a very varied uh, audience like uh, demographic wise and yeah. everything. So, yeah. I think that uh, we are done to our last question here and I originally wanted to ask about the future of live operations but I think that one uh, kind of a particular theme for the whole uh, uh, panel today has been that nothing is so nothing is said there's no patterns there's no kind of uh, rules and laws that you can draw from you need to constantly learn and kind of up, upgrade things and and uh, be very human being in the development, not just kind of a maths a, a genius or something like that. So how do you actually, it's, it's, it's a new thing. There are other industries that also do uh, live operations, but how do you learn? How do you, like, what are your ways to become better and, and, and um, stay on the top of the competition in live operations as well? How do you learn about these things? What are the tools for learning? Well, um, in, internally, um, I could at least uh, say that obviously everybody is uh, probably following uh, uh, what everybody else is, is doing right. and, and gathering uh, then kind of like that knowledge uh, from, from outside of the company. But uh, something that uh, we are also doing uh, internally is that um, since we are five studios and uh, 19 titles, so there's a lot of us uh, already um, within Rovio, and uh, we have this uh, thing called uh, Live Ops Forum uh, that we have just uh, kicked off, uh, which is a um, kind of like the a virtual team of the people uh, doing Live Ops. Uh, so product leads and designers, product managers uh, of of the uh, certain key games that are. Uh, you know, uh, talk on uh, regular basis, uh, have, have their own almost like a backlog for the, for the, for the live up stuff, uh, share learnings, um, do, uh, do kind of like uh, informal stuff also together um, so that uh, we get this kind of like, because it's, it's, it's about learning, it's, it's also a lot about failing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that having that kind of like the feeling of trust where you can actually uh, also talk about the things that didn't go that well so that the others are not repeating uh, those same mistakes uh, right. is that we, we you know try to create that uh, in-house but uh, I, I know that uh, we have been uh, talking about possibly also expanding it uh, at least in the Helsinki area uh, with the other companies so yeah, sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do this. Yeah, and, and I think uh, on top of this kind of in, in industry uh, sharing, uh, like within kind of here in Europe and, and so on, like you have mentioned several times the Asian games, like you just have to look there, like it's just insane. Like you have hundreds of events uh, a month or, or hundreds a week, um, actually. And, and, and how, how do you keep that system and puzzle together and, and like those tools like they are like on another other level so like I think there's there, there's a lot to learn if if you're making a game where where that that kind of uh, event system fits yeah, so. yeah there's like uh, lots to learn outside of the Western market 
uh, but I still feel that we have to figure out what is our way of approaching and uh, like uh, um, yeah but it's I would say that uh, one thing for sort of like if you're if you're designing a game working on a new game uh, one of the things to be thought if you think about the future of gaming is really consider learning a lot about the Asian games uh, like difference of difference between Japanese and Chinese games is already huge mm. um, and it's not it's not like we can't just go and copy what everyone else is doing usually that doesn't work usually you need to learn a lot and then figure it out yourself sort of like thinking about what is the creative way of doing it uh, for like our kind of games in a way but I think uh, like if we talk about the future of live ops. We can still it talk is, about yeah, it, yeah, yes, sure. If, if we would talk about that topic, uh, <laughs> yeah. then uh, I would uh, like most definitely push people to look at the Asian games more. So the future is already <laughs> there, so they are um, ahead uh, already in the, the time zone, so they also yes, know a lot of true. things. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. It's like six or seven hours. Ahead. Yeah depending if it's w winter or summer, at least yeah, in Japan. I think that's like what, you, what you just said is that we just need to figure out our way of doing it. Yeah, it's like yeah. I think that we've also seen examples where, you know, the, the games that they have have been kind of like taking to West and yeah. they are not working. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's like exactly. uh, also kind of like understanding that what, are, what have they done and why is it working and yeah. it, does that same kind of like apply yeah. Also, uh, in our case, and lots of uh, live ops is about going into this huge content treadmill where you just need to create content, more and more content. You sort of like teach the players that there will be more in the future, and then mm -hmm. uh, like that's something that I think the West, like uh, sort of more Western style games, uh, 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 need to figure out. Uh, like if we want to do it also big in the in the Asian markets. So the global industry is not completely global, you need to know how yeah, it's really different local. countries. Yeah, it's like it, it might be really local. But yeah. of course like like the way we like to think about the players that there's ev like it like you don't have to represent certain nationality to be certain kind of players. So they are like a really different kind of players <laughs> mm. globally but uh, uh, but it, it is sort of, it's not easy to create live ops that would work for every single player. Yeah, and, and related to this, if, if we keep talking about the future, so um, One Direction is, is definitely machine learning and, and yeah. kind of more predictive modeling and, and kind of like really go to a kind of deeper level with the dynamic pricing and like truly making like these kind of personalized events uh, at, and, and services at scale. So um, I, I think that's that's an area that's that's r really really growing and, and we're we're definitely heavily investing and and, and looking into as well that uh, how do you actually take this whole thing uh, forward. Yeah. How, how do you keep the one person live ops exactly. team? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, the, that's the plan uh, that sort of really investing to buzzwords, machine learning and AI. Uh, and uh, that, that is sort of you can't make everything with like uh, done by robots. Uh, you need the manual touch like in every single <laughs> sort of thing that needs creativity, it needs a human touch, but, uh, but I think that there's lots to do with, mm. with machine learning and AI and live ops, yeah. yeah. Hey, are, you, are you with the future views here, machine learning? Um, uh, yes, um, <laughs> I, I, I kind of like the, the machine learning or kind of like the AI, I, I think that uh, probably kind of like the, the, you know, intermediate step is, is probably kind of like, um, uh, how, how to assisted decision making process mm -hmm. and I think that 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 already kind of like you say that when when you for example when you look at the look at your game it can like 
you know, the, the tools can all, almost like suggest that, uh, you know, uh, I, I suggest removing this level, for mm. example, or... Tools uh, again, yes. Yeah, mm. but I, I think that they, like, uh, we, we've been mentioning it uh, often that I, uh, it, it, it's about that particular game. Mm. Uh, and, mm. and you need to kind of like, it, it starts from the game design. And, yeah. and, and there, I, I, I think that the, for the future games, uh, it, also the design needs to start from the kind of like that service uh, mindset and, mm. uh, and, and, and the thing that you are actually almost kind of like picture yourself how you are operating that game uh, mm. when it has been there for two years already. Right. Uh, what, how does it feel for the player? Yep. So when the trend of service design started to come <laughs> to games, uh, that's already quite a long time ago, but uh, it feels like yesterday. Um, we kind of, we saw that business model, business logics needs to be integral part of the game design. But also now we need to think about that this actual service model, how the game works on a daily basis for the next two years, needs to be part of the design uh, uh, in early stage already, which is kind of super fascinating. How do we integrate that into uh, kind of imagining the game experience yeah. of the players? And it doesn't only include mobile games, but also bigger games, also the Chinese super yeah. huge, massive uh, kind of uh, content loaded games. And, every single part of the industry is affected by that. So I strongly suggest that you kind of um, maybe contact uh, Heini and Emmia and Lauri here if you want to learn from the best in the Finnish industry. And then also there are a lot of uh, content out there, maybe not always in line because the term, terminology, the term and the ways that game industry do these things are not always the same. So there is not one single pattern like in any other things in game industry. So unfortunately, we cannot just learn and then go there. We need to be brave, like we've been talking here. Unfortunately, also we have in games now, we have a topic of uh, artificial intelligence and testing with artificial te intelligence. So that is something to also look at, like our panelists are here indicating that is hashtag machine learning is coming. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things. and I. I think that we are running out of time, we're a little bit over time already. So I would like to thank uh, our panelists here today and uh, audience here at Design Factory and uh, everybody watching our stream online. Games Now is an open lecture series running once a month from Alta University. And we have a great lineup coming this spring 2018, sorry, 2018. And it almost feels like 2008, but anyway. <laughs> so we have a great lineup. So make sure that you subscribe our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook so that you wouldn't miss any of that. We'd like to see you here every time, but if you can't make it, make sure that you don't miss any of the streams. And if you want to be part of the Aalto uh, University as a game student, we have master's program uh, application still open, so please apply to that to become part of our community. Um, so yeah, my name is Anna Kaisa Kultima and this is Games Now. We are going to continue discussions here at the premises and uh, welcome next time.